What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Wade Concept Podcast. My name is Wade Plemons, and I'm your host, as always. And yes, I know it has been about four days since my last upload, but we finally got my laptop fixed. My Mac is, is ready to go. Apple said we're A-OK, so let's just jump right into it. Now, I left you guys with, I left off with the UFC 217 card in my review and recap of that card. Um, UFC Norfolk, Virginia had, had come right after that, the weekend after. We had talked about that a little bit, and I think that that card was such a great card for what it was. You had older seasoned veterans having great performances like Clay Guida, Matt Brown had a great performance. Um, he had young guys like Sage Northcutt establish, establish themselves as being, I wouldn't say, you know, a top contender or top 10 contender, but being someone that belongs in the UFC. Um, so you saw these guys, it was just a combination of different stories. I think it was a really solid card overall. Um, and I think you guys saw that, but I did want to start off, lead off this episode with, of course, the number one figure, personality, person, fighter, um, mainstream mogul there is in, in, in MMA and, and combat sports, and that'd be Conor McGregor. Um, this week, not so much for, for the good things, and I'm a big Conor fan. I think you guys know it by now. If you don't, um, I'm one of his biggest probably one of his biggest fans and just watching his rise and the things that he went through coming up and just his mental fortitude. Uh, the guy has, a, his mind is a steel trap or at least was, um, and we'll get into that, but it just, it seems so much like so much of him is so, so much self-belief and, and discipline and hard work. And, um, you know, he just has that X factor, that combination of skill, um, God-given ability, personality that you really don't find in literally anyone else in combat sports right now. He's the only guy with all of that. And the ability to back up when he says he does things is, is you know, because everyone loves a trash talker. Everyone loves someone that's going to stir the pot. But when you double down and then back it up, forget about it. You know, that, yeah, of course, you're going to take over the world. Um, but this week, we're going to talk about Conor for a little bit different in in a little different context. Um, So Bellator, the competitor of the UFC, it's another MMA promote or yeah, MMA promotion. Um, Not as big, but they employ a a good number of fighters on their roster. They have some pretty big name fighters, Michael Chandler, um, Paul Daly's on that roster. I'm not really familiar with Bellator, but um, they have a lot of decent fighters. Lorenz Larkin's on their roster. I'm Roy McDonald's on their roster. So they have big name fighters that are coming over and they treat their fighters well. And I'm starting to get more into Bellator, but um, they they also put on events outside of the country as well. And this week they were in Ireland for uh, Bellator 187. And um, one of Connor's friends, one of his training partners at SBG, uh, was fighting on that card. A former UFC employed fighter, his name's Charlie Ward, he was fighting on that card and uh, knocks out his opponent in kind of controversial fashion at the end of the first round. Um, Controversy not being that he was actually knocked out, but the controversy being it was so close to round two that they didn't, you know, there was that kind of disparity. Did he knock him out or did the ref stop the fight? To Conor McGregor, there was no disparity. Um, Charlie Ward knocks his opponent down to the ground. The horn sounds. Conor jumps into the cage. And my knowledge of the rules on jumping into the cage versus staying in the crowd, obviously, as a fan, is something you shouldn't do ever. Um, I'm not sure what the actual rule is. And you get into a lot of murky water with the com- – there's no commission in Ireland versus in the U.S. There's state commissions um, from state to state. So there's a clear regulation on who can be punished and who can't be. Uh, Mike Mazzulli, who would be the head of the ABC, which is the American Boxing Committee, he was out there. Um, and there's, he, he was, you know, the event runner, he was running the event. Um, and so he has, and he's probably one of the bigger, uh, presences in the actual commissions. The American boxing commission is, is a pretty big deal. And so he has his reach on what he can do. Um, but the specifics on it, I think are kind of murky and kind of up in the air. Regardless, Connor runs into the cage immediately after the fight, not even knowing as fans, which I thought the fight was stopped. I thought the fight was over, but it was close. It's in the second round. The Connor jumps into the cage before really anything is settled. 
referee Mark Goddard, who Connor has had issues in the past with, um, dating back a couple of months or maybe a month ago to UFC Dansk in Poland. Um, Connor was kind of giving advice to one of his other SPG partners on the outside of the cage. Again, acting as maybe possibly a fourth corner man, which would be against the rules, even though he was there as a fan. And Mark Goddard, you know, temporarily stopped the fight and told Connor to, to you know, return to his seat. Um, and they had some words, but it didn't really, you know, didn't really uh, make in anything. This time, though, Connor comes into the cage. Apparently, Mark Goddard tells him the fight's not over. He needs to get out of the cage. He has to um, ensure both fighters are okay and ensure if this fight is really over. Connor takes exception and runs over. And there's a couple of things that happen, and need, and none of them are a good look for Connor. Um, first off, he runs over and pushes a referee, which again, I am very new to the MMA sports, uh, rule set, but in any sport, touching an official is one of the biggest no-nos you can do. Um, for example, in baseball, you'll get a five to 10 game suspension in football. You're looking at a, a two to three game suspension NFL and college. You're looking at maybe the year you might be out for the year. So, and in the UFC prior, and just for my research, the, Anytime that's happened previously, you're looking at guys getting fired. You're looking at guys getting suspended for a year, suspended indefinitely in Roy Nelson's case. Obviously, he was, he was, uh, later that sentence was reduced by Dana White, but he touched referee Big John McCarthy and kind of shoved him off, got an indefinite suspension. So Connor, first off, pushes the ref because he feels like the ref is, is, not stopping, and this is Connor's words. He didn't. He thought the ref was going to let the fight go on, knowing that the guy was knocked out on the ground. And so he gets us way more upset than anyone should get. Runs over, shoves the referee, and not only is the referee being shoved, but the the gentleman, the opponent of Charlie Ward, is still knocked out on the ground. Um, you can tell that he's been KO'd, and this fight should be stopped. But there was no time for anyone to set up and, and actually figure out what's going on because Connor's in the cage and now the entourage is there and Connor's pushing the referee and the referee's running into a downed fighter who is probably concussed on the ground. Um, and that's where you run into some really, really tough stuff that you really don't want to get into because now you're looking at maybe assault charges and possibly some kind of, you know, criminal activity. And I don't want to, it's not that serious, but when you, you know, it does become that way when you have an opponent downed on the ground, knocked out, and his, you know, people are being shoved into him. He's trying to get to his feet and, and clear his head, clear the cobwebs, and he can't do so. He's getting pushed over again and pushed over again. You can, t you know, he's probably concussed. So that's that's the area you kind of want to avoid. Um, and Connor did, you know, issue an apology on the whole event after he he kind of went on Twitter and did his stick where he f all of yous and um, probably not in the best taste. But he did he did issue an apology and. Um, you know, I get it. Connor was really excited for his friend. He had just won a fight, and Connor's done this before with guys like Artem Lobov, um, where he's jumped into the cage to celebrate. And I get it, man. I, I, if one of my friends does something, especially a guy that I've known for years, and they're like my buddy just had his wedding a couple of months ago, and I was so happy for him, man. I hadn't seen him in a couple of years, and I was so happy for him. You know, after the wedding, we're all just dogpiling him, doing the whole thing, and it's just, it's, it's one of those things is just in the moment you can't really it just, it just happens you know I understand that um but if he waits maybe five minutes they let they probably let him in the cage I know again I don't know the rules on who gets to come into the cage after the fight and who gets to celebrate but if he waits maybe two or three minutes he gets to come in the cage anyway regardless um that's not the issue I mean it is in some ways but it's not the issue in the fact that okay you come in you celebrate with your buddy if they tell you to leave the cage you can't flip out like a madman and go after the referee. And then to make it worse, and this is after the fact, they escort Connor from the cage. Um, he he kind of does a victory lap and, and galvanizes the Irish people. And then I guess they officially announced the fight that been, has been uh, decided in KO fashion. Connor comes up to the cage again and sits on the cage like you'll see some fighters do after they win a fight. They'll run over and kind of straddle the cage. Connor does so, and another Bellator official puts his hand up to try to guard Connor from coming in, you know, coming in again, and kind of pushes Connor a little bit. Connor falls back a little, but then slaps him, gives him the the Irish freaking, you know, lucky charm slap to the head, 
and now you're assaulting another official that has nothing to do with the fight that's just an event official for Bellator. And so that was the part that was a little tough to watch. Um, I'm a big Connor fan. I am. I, I love every, you know a lot of what he does. Um, he's so composed in his life. I feel like he's he's taken every right step um, with what he's doing. And it, you know, not that everybody's going to like him. Not that everybody's going to be his friend. But I think for himself, he had taken every right step to get to that Mayweather fight, to get to where he's gotten to. And he's worked hard. He's probably worked harder than I'll ever work in my life. You know, the guy has, has put in the time and the effort. But you can't, and this is something I heard Chael Sonnen talk about. I've heard this, I've heard a couple of different people talk about is when you get these guys that are young fighters, Connor's still 28 years old. When you get these guys that are young and have that amount of money, and Connor's got close to Mike Tyson. I mean, I wouldn't say Mike Tyson money because Mike Tyson at some point had $400 million, but he's, had, he's sitting on $100 million and change. And you start to see, and even some UFC fighters, you could tell they were, you could hear them saying, oh, well, even the strongest willed and the strongest minded, you know, will be corrupted by money. And, you know, some people I saw saying, well, it was a matter of time before, you know, the money got to him. And you hate to see that because, like I said, I'm a, I'm a huge Conor fan, and I think a lot of people are. And you'd seen some antics from him before, the UFC 205 press conference with the chair above the head and the, you know, it was getting a little cartoonish, but what you don't want is a guy, is to see a guy that, worked through so much, I'll, you know, find an end at his road as far as Connor's always had a goal. You know, it's always been, okay, we do this, then we move on to this. There's in the UFC, for example, it was, or even before the UFC, we're in cage warriors. Let's win two, you know, two weight division world titles. The, the goal has always been to go to the UFC. Gets to the UFC. Okay. I want that featherweight belt. Cool. Featherweight belt. Now I want the lightweight belt. Got it. But again, during all of this, he's predicting it, and no one's telling him no. Granted, who should? Because that put the, that put the sport on the main stage. It helps sell that company for $4.2 billion. So every time he's reaching one of these goals, he's setting another and another and another. What happens when those goals or when he feels like he doesn't have anything else left to prove? And in the past, you've seen when those goals and that, that hunger goes away, Money corrupts a lot of people, especially young, brash athletes that hit that that pinnacle of what they want and then say, well, I've done everything I've wanted. I've predicted it, and especially in Connor's case, I predicted it. I said I would do it, and I did it. No one's ever told me no. No one's ever stopped me. I'm pretty much invincible. You know, that's that's what that mindset becomes is I've never been stopped. I've never been deterred. Once I hit this certain level of success, granted, he's had failures just like all of us have had failures. But once you get to a certain level and you predict and you do things over and over and it's always, yes, win, win, win. And then there's finally that pinnacle. What's next? What happens after you just fight Floyd Mayweather for $100 million and there's really nothing that, that can ever match that as far as financially? Um, in the UFC, you're taking a lot more risk coming back into that that arena. You know, and so when there's no hunger there, when there's no drive for whatever it is that he wants or needs, sometimes it goes right back to the corruption of money. Saying, "Well, I've got a hundred million. What? Who can tell me what to do? Who can tell me I can't do this, this, and this?" And as a fan in that situation, especially Conor McGregor doesn't realize that he's not bigger than MMA. And and that's my opinion. I think it's a lot of people's opinion. No one is bigger than the sport. And Conor McGregor, at that moment, at least knowingly or unknowingly tried to make himself bigger than that sport because he was a fan and he thought he had the right to jump into the cage. He thought he had the right to push Mark Goddard and to slap an Bellator official. He didn't have the right to do any of those things. So um, the UFC had had, to, had reached out to Mike Mazzulli apparently. And this is another part of the story. Apparently uh, the UFC had reached out to Mike Mazzulli, he which he stated on the Ariel Hawani show, um, the MMA Hour saying that Connor would be removed from, and they said they had booked Connor for the UFC 219 event December 30th. And now, you know, obviously with things that went on, the situation that happened, they were going to remove him from that card. Here's two reasons why I don't think that's true. One, Connor McGregor 
just made $100 million in a boxing match with, with Floyd Mayweather. For them to get that deal done after he asked in the couple in the, the past couple of weeks for he wanted to be a partner promotion deal with the UFC. He wanted McGregor Promotions to be a partner with the UFC. When he asked for that deal, on top of the fact that this card is only five weeks away now, six weeks away, for them to make that deal with Conor McGregor to fight Tony Ferguson for what would probably be, he's not going to, I don't think he would get that promotional. I don't think he's going to get a split on the promotion. I don't think it's just not going to happen. And he, it would take a lot longer than a couple of weeks for him, for them to just say, no, you're not getting that. And him go, okay, I'll just fight Tony Ferguson, this killer who's won 11 or 10 or 11 straight in the 155 division for $10 million. He just made 10 times that. So I don't think that they would book him six weeks out that quickly after stating he wants half of the promotion. Granted, that's not going to happen, but that's, it's a negotiating tactic that they both are going to have to figure out. And that, I think that's going to take until next March or next May. But this is the second reason the UFC wanted to look like, and you know, right or wrong, I don't know, but they wanted to look like they were punishing the number one guy. So they reach out to Mike Mazzulli, head of the ABC, say, hey, look, what he did was wrong. We don't condone it. We're going to punish him by taking him off our big card of the year. We're going to not let him. He's not going to make any more money this year. That's going to be his punishment. The one thing that kind of throws a wrench in this and kind of makes it a little tough to believe, one, I just stated um, the whole deal going out, and then two, Connor's manager comes right after and kind of puts throws the cold water on the UFC when they're trying to make it look like they're punishing their guy. You know, right or wrong, again, I don't know. But Connor's manager comes out and says that's not true, that that was his full statement, that's not true. Well, now not only do you have, and that's the one guy, Mike Mazzulli, you probably want to smooth things over with because he can control where Connor kind of fights. If he can get Nevada State Commission or LA or California State Commission or New York State Commission on his side, they can ban him from fighting in those states. So, and that's my understanding. If I'm wrong there, obviously let me know in the comments and tell me how much of an idiot I am. But the whole situation is just a bad look for. Connor for the UFC for mixed martial arts because you don't want to revert back to oh well these guys just don't have any control and Connor for the longest time has had the most self control but again when you have that much money you know you feel like no one can tell you no no one can tell you anything so moving on um, this was kind of a cool story actually this story could turn into something really cool so the UFC is having and they've had these problems for a little bit. When you have these big cards like UFC 217, and th to my knowledge, they'd never done before like two, before maybe 200 or 199, they never done a card with three title fights on the card at the same time because it kind of leaves you with booking gaps in your pay per view. So you're going to look at, you put three titles on one card, it's kind of tough to fill out those two, three, four pay per views afterward because you just took up three weight divisions, the biggest fights in those divisions, right? So the UFC is having a little bit of an issue with that um, after the 217 card. 218 is set. They've got some really good fights. Max Holloway, and I told you guys on the last podcast, I did not think Jose Aldo would get that fight. Well, turns out Jose Aldo will be fighting Max Holloway um, at UFC 218 in the main event. My heart goes out to Cub Swanson um, and Ricardo Lamas. I thought both of those guys deserved a shot. I, you know, Jose Aldo does deserve his shot. I get that. Personally, I just wanted to see Cub Swanson or Ricardo Lamas. I wanted to see Cub Swanson a little more um, because the guy hasn't had his title shot. And he's been, granted, he's lost to Max Holloway before. It was by submission. Um, but he's been cleaning that division out, and he's been taking on some killers. Um, I hope one day. Now, the tough part about the Cub Swanson thing is that his deal is coming up, and maybe that's why I didn't get the fight because you don't want your champion to have no fights left and be a free agent if he were to beat Max Holloway. So I get it, but... Uh, hopefully, hopefully Cub can can uh, get the next shot at the title. But this fight, and going back to what I was talking about, 218 is set. But then you look at 219, and before this week, and I got some news on that. But before this week, we didn't have a main event for 219, December 30th. Probably the the one card at the end of the year that everybody wants to kind of end off the year, you know, because that fourth quarter for the UFC is kind of crucial. They're going to make a lot of money on that 217 card. But can you end off the year in a good way? Can you end off the year on the right foot and start into the first quarter of 218? or excuse me, 2018, uh, with a good with a good start. 
And for the longest time, we didn't have a main event. And this last week, rumors started to circulate very quietly about Tyron Woodley possibly having a fight before the end of the year. Tyron Woodley's asked, and he said, yeah, I'm going to fight before the end of the year if we can get the deal done. So there's a little bit of kind of mystery in the air on who Tyron Woodley's opponent would be and where it would be. Would it be at 218? That's a little early. It'd only be a two-week notice. So you would think, assume you would assume 219 is the card he would fight on. And so, you know, the more you hear, the more rumors come out, you find out, and this is crazy because it doesn't make sense at all as far as the rankings go. And again, anybody in the MMA community know the rankings really don't mean squat anymore, um, especially with WME um, as an entertainment clunk. Excuse me. I cannot talk today. The WME is an entertainment conglomerate that owns the UFC now, so obviously they're trying to, plus they built, they, they spent $4.2 billion buying the UFC. So they got to make that money back. And of course, they're going to put on entertaining matchups regardless of, and again, not a big fan of this, but regardless of, of where the rankings are, I think the rankings should be more. I think that makes the belts mean more. I think that's how you bring in viewers. But um, big fights make make money. So, And again, I can't say I'm not excited about this, but now you see Nate Diaz is starting to train. Nate Diaz, who had said he is not fighting until Conor McGregor comes back for that trilogy fight, has all of a sudden started his training. Okay, well, the week goes on. About midweek, Tyron Woodley goes on TMZ and announces that he has signed his side of the fight bout, that they have offered the fight of Tyron Woodley versus Nate Diaz at UFC 219. And Tyron Woodley has gone out, stated that he has signed, and that Nate Diaz is all they're waiting for. That fight would be, I mean, again, I don't agree that it's the fight to make. I think Tyron Woodley has a lot of contenders. Robbie Lawler, RDA, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is probably going to have to wait a little bit because not a lot of people want to see that third fight after the second one. Colby Covington, who we will get to in a little bit. But that fight is an entertaining as hell fight. Because you have two different styles, and again, they've offered this fight, so this could be the fight at 219. And if it is, then to break it down, you know, you have two different styles. You got Tyron Woodley, who is a monster. I mean, an absolute freak. When he walks into the cage, he has to be 200 pounds fighting at 170. I mean, he's just jacked up, right? Fighting a guy in Nate Diaz, never really been jacked. Cardio King can take anybody's punch. Took Conor McGregor's punches. Didn't go down two fights in a row. I mean, he got wobbled in the first. He got put on the the canvas a couple of times, but never knocked out by Conor McGregor. Granted, Tyron Woodley's in a whole other atmosphere in his power punching. The guy hits you and you go to sleep. One punch, legit top five KO power, right? AD has probably has the better boxing as far as technique goes. Um, Tyron Woodley obviously would have the advantage in wrestling. Nate Diaz, a lot of people forget, is a black belt on the ground. Black belt jiu-jitsu on the ground, so... Tyron Woodley wouldn't be able to, unless, again, he's a freak. He could just probably maneuver his way around. It's an interesting fight, right? And right now they're still in talks, I guess, or Nate Diaz is still trying to figure out with his team what he wants to do. Uh, but there's been some trash talk there, the whole don't be scared, homie. That's Nate Diaz's thing. Well, Tyron Woodley is 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 calling him out. Don't be scared, homie. Sign the, sign the second part of the fight bout. Let's get it started. So that would be an interesting fight, I think. If I were to, to look at it, I would think Tyron Woodley would have the advantage as far as just his explosiveness, his speed, um, his wrestling, his legit knockout power. I don't think Nate Diaz is walking Tyron down and knocking him out. But if it does go into those later rounds, Nate Diaz does not get tired. The man swims to Alcatraz and back as training, as, as something he does. His brother swam there three or four times. You know, they do triathlons, marathons. They Those guys don't get tired. Um, and they're slick on, off their back. Triangles, arm bars, rear naked choke. They get there. They do that. So there's a couple of different things you have to, to, you have to weigh about both of those fighters. Um, I can easily see Nate winning that fight. I mean, obviously, if they do, the UFC is, has offered this fight, and I think what the, what the plan is, would be is if Nate wins that fight. I mean, talk about they're already trying to make the Connor Nate 
trilogy, of course, that's already going to be a huge fight. But think if Nate Diaz wins the 170 title, Conor McGregor defends against Tony Ferguson in March or May or whenever, and then they meet for that trilogy for the 170 belt or whatever it is, you're talking about probably the biggest fight in UFC history. And I know we've said it over and over and over, but that would be the biggest fight in UFC history. Do I think it's going to happen? There's so many variables, to, even to this Tyron Woodley, Nate Diaz fight, so I don't know. I still would give Tyron the advantage. Um, it'd be an interesting fight. Of course, I would watch it. Uh, I don't agree with, with the fact that they would book him, because what do the rankings mean? I mean, we've sat here and asked, you know, as UFC fans, as MMA fans, we've asked, what do the rankings even mean anymore? We're probably going to ask 100 more times. They don't care. They're just going to make interesting matchups. So, it is what it is. But moving on, um, there's also more news on the UFC 219 event. And we have a main event, folks. Finally, a month and a half out from the card, we have a main event, and it's a doozy. So if you guys haven't seen, um, they have been trying to book Cyborg versus Holly Holm for a long time, uh, the last couple of months. They thought they'd had it done. They didn't have it done. They couldn't come to an agreement. Turns out, we've got it done. So, your main event for UFC 219 will be Chris Cyborg versus Holly Holm for the Women's 145-pound championship. Huge fight. Huge fight. Um, And I think what actually kind of occurred was they were having a little trouble with Cyborg uh, nearing the end of her contract. And Holly Holm... Uh, just wanted, you know, signed a contract ready to fight Chris Cyborg, taking a little time. Finally, they've inked a new deal with Chris Cyborg. Um, so it looks like she's under a new contract now. And um, she's, I guess, going to be kind of locked down with the UFC for a good amount. So that's good. That means that we'll have, you know, a consistent champion at that 145 division where there's not a lot of players yet. But as more come, you know, whoever it is, Holly or Cyborg, we'll have someone consistently there what you want when you bring in a new division. Um, but this fight in particular, man, this fight is is something else. You've got Cyborg, who is probably regarded kind of around the world as the best featherweight women's fighter on the planet. Um, even back when, when Ronda Rousey was dominating the 135 division and they wanted, had called her, you know, the best women, you know, women's fighter ever on earth, ever. And to that time, she, she, you know, she kind of was. She had never, she beat everybody in front of her. Obviously, the Holly Holm head kick changed everything. And that's what makes this fight so interesting because Holly Holm has beaten not only um, Ronda Rousey, but if she beats Cyborg, granted, she's lost to Misha Tate. She lost to Jermaine uh, Durandame on a wonky decision where Duranda may hit her twice after the bell. I thought Holly won the fight. Um, but if she beats the top two women to have ever by consistent, by consensus, whoever, you know, makes the consensus, everybody believes the top two women in MMA history with Ronda Rousey, Chris Cyborg, if she beats both of those girls, how do you not call her the best women's fighter ever? I know it won't seem like it, but you beat the top two, you know, you're the goat. It's not as easy as saying that because Chris Cyborg is terrifying and is probably and people she's probably the best striker um in the in women's MMA right now. Holly Holm, her their boxing, her kickboxing, that question mark kick she hit on Betch Gohea. Oh my goodness. Um it's it's tough, man. You're gonna see I would give the advantage obviously to Cyborg just because a lot of people forget she's a black belt. Off her back as well. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. She doesn't have to use it a lot because she's throwing girls around on their heads. But if she does get caught in that situation, and I don't think Holly wants to go to the ground with her. So maybe that's what Chris Cyborg does. You know, sets up her her takedowns, sets up some, some uh, maybe pulls. I don't want to say she's going to pull guard, but sets up some takedowns with some of her strikes because Holly is dangerous on her feet. Is absolutely dangerous on her feet. And she's, you know, worked the clinch, worked how to get out of the clinch with Ronda. Um, so maybe, you know, Cyborg wants to, you know, set up takedowns with strikes, getting close, kind of the same game plan, but also, uh, can stand with Holly. 
by far a ton, light and day better striker than Ronda Rousey is. So she will try to, I'm, I don't think she has any problem standing with Holly Holm either. But a great fight, and I got to say, I'm, I'm really excited. As the main event for the 219 card, that's that's a huge main event. Um, UFC can take my money on that one, for sure. But moving on, um, now a couple different things have happened. So to, two days from now, we are going to get the UFC fight night in Sydney, Sydney, Australia. And the headliner on that card is Reese over Doom versus... Um, Martin or Marcin Tybura, I think Marcin Tybura, yeah. So Fabrice Overdoom, number number two fighter in the heavyweight division, is going to be taking on Marcin Tybura. And regardless, that's you know I, that's a good card. I hope that I hope that uh, Verdum can can stay a title contender. I don't know much about Marcin Tybura, but um, from his record, obviously he looks like a killer. So that should be a good fight. But that's not what we're going to talk about. What we're going to talk about is what's happened in the week leading up to uh, UFC Sydney. Unfortunate event, um, kind of interesting, kind of a little, you know, gimmicky, kind of weird. But you know, th- this is the the MMA world, right? So leading up to uh, UFC Sydney, the UFC had brought out Colby Covington who's famous or infamous uh, in the last couple of, of weeks is just rising. His his stardom is just skyrocketing or his following is skyrocketing because of, again, his famous or infamous uh, post-fight speech in Brazil when uh, just a couple weeks ago he took on Damian Maia and um, beat Damian Maia, which is, you know, obviously he's Brazilian, but came out, calls uh, Brazilians filthy animals, says a lot of expletives toward their country and come out later explained that he was getting stuff thrown on him and he doesn't respect anyone that doesn't respect him and has since you know stirred the pot a little bit on social media as well with him and John Jones going back and forth uh, a lot of people taking shots at Colby Covington for disrespecting um, Brazilians and the nation of Brazil and I think all of this has been obviously if if you're a pro wrestling fan if you're any kind of good guy versus bad guy what you can see it in action movies you can see it in pro wrestling you can see it in in any type of setting the good guy does the the noble thing and respects the bad guy comes after everyone and tells everyone they're terrible and gets the crowd really riled up well me being a fan of pro wrestling i've seen this before i know what kobe Huffington's doing and he's playing what's called the heel um and he's not doing a great job of it, but he's doing a good enough job to rub people the wrong way. And that's, I mean, that's what you want. So he's doing, I guess he's doing one thing right in that sense. Um, but this kind of took it to another level. So the UFC invited Colby Covington, Colby Covington out to uh, UFC Sydney to participate in a couple of interviews as their special guest fighter. Um, obviously Colby Covington is number three, 170 year in the world looking for that title shot versus Tyron Woodley. Well, I guess uh, Reese Overdoom and Colby Covington, I guess, had seen each other in a hotel lobby down there and um, had some words. Uh, Colby Covington obviously called him what he had called other Brazilians, filthy animal. Reese Overdoom being a heavyweight contender and former heavyweight champion, probably one of the greatest heavyweights on earth, probably not the guy you want to call any sort of name. I don't care if you're a UFC fighter or not. Uh, Apparently... From from reports, Fabrice Overdoom throws the right hand, punches Colby in the face. And we also have, there's also been video of him throwing a boomerang. Yeah, an actual boomerang in Sydney, Australia. Can life get any better than that? Um, no. He throws a boomerang at Colby Covington, hits him in the face with that as well. And um, they are separated and things kind of kind of dissipate from there. But here's my thing. So Colby Covington, I get it. I get the shtick. He's playing the bad guy. He wants people to to hate him, but you know, watch him so that he can get this title fight um, with Tyron Woodley, and it's working for him. I'm not saying he's doing a good job of it. He's kind of the trash talk's not really there, um, but he's doing his best, I guess, and he's getting people riled up. So you know, props to him. But in this case, and a lot of people were, you know. 
even like some people like Brendan Schaub and Ariel Hawaii were, were telling him to run with that because that's the way that the, you know, the MMA scene is going. That's the way the business is going now. You kind of have to market yourself in ways to get you title fights, regardless of your ranking. Again, I don't agree with it, but the guys that make the most noise are going to get the title fights, right? And so that's what he's doing. And this one might have taken it a little too far because I get it. You're doing the filthy animal thing. But now you're disrespecting the man and he's not he's done nothing to you, right? The guy's done nothing to you. Um, you call him a filthy animal and you know expect no repercussions. I, I'm not sure what you're thinking there. But not only that, but re reports come out later that Colby Covington has in fact pressed charges against Fabrice Overdoom for punching him in the face and leaving a mark on his face. And here's my thing. Like I said, you're doing the, the, the heel, you're, you're playing the bad guy, but once you press charges on the man, after you enticed him, after you called him these names and, and, and kind of agged him on, you get punched and then you call the authorities and you, you press charges. You can't be the bad guy if you're going to go and press charges on the guy for fighting back, you know, for, for standing up for himself. Regardless, I don't think that anybody should stand up for themselves with physical violence in, an, in a situation that doesn't call for it. But if you're if you're enticing the guy, if you're sitting there just bagging him on, calling him names, you're the bad guy. You're the guy that talks the stuff and backs it up and, and sends the crowd home angry and steaming, right? You can't go call the police, man. You can't press charges on the guy. That's just it's hard to explain it, but that's just you can't it's not man code to do it. You know, if you're gonna sit there and entice a fight and then press charges on the guy, you're not the bad guy anymore. You're just another guy that's that's Talking and not backing it up, I guess. Because the bad guy would have, you know, yeah, he probably would have taken the shot to the face, but would have spun it to, to somehow get more heat on himself. I don't think calling the police gets you any heat on yourself anymore other than the fact that people are just now disappointed in you and just, it's, it's turned into a gimmick now because it's not real. You know, now you're claiming assault. You're not the bad guy. You're just a guy. Anyway... That that altercation still up in the air. Um, the UFC did send Colby Covington home um, from his guest appearances, and I guess they're going to look further into the situation before they do anything with that. But when it comes to you, we'll have it for you. So, moving on, um, I'll do this last kind of bit, and then we will talk about a little bit of the UFC Sydney preview. I don't know where this came from. I think I saw this on Ariel Hawani's show. But again, I told you guys I'm a big wrestling fan, a big WWE fan. Watched it for years, um, on and off. But some cool news. There's a lot. There's always a lot of transition. And I think you see this. You've seen it with Brock Lesnar. You've seen it in disappointing fashion with uh, CM Punk or Phil Brooks. But now you have we have another WWE wrestler moving into the MMA scene. Um, I don't, you guys that do watch WWE will know him as Jack Swagger. He has signed a deal, a six-fight deal, over three years with Bellator. Again, the rival promotion, or I don't want to say rival promotion because that's they're their own thing. The promotion that isn't affiliated with uh, the UFC in the U.S. Um, Jack Swagger, his actual name is Jake Hager, signed a six-fight, three-year deal. Uh, he was talking with Ariel Hawani about kind of what he wanted to do. Um, he said he wanted to fight twice a year. He, he said he didn't want to be on the CM Punk uh, fight schedule, which is once, I think, in the last three years. But he, he said he wants to fight twice a year. Um, he is, again, actually has some legit credentials. He's a former All-American wrestler, college football athlete at the University of Oklahoma. Um, he is 35, so that is a little bit late coming into the UFC or the uh, Bellator in general, just the MMA scene. Um, so we'll see. He doesn't have a fight set. Um, he did say his dream fight would be would be to fight Roy Nelson, who is a heavyweight at Bellator right now. And he's coming in kind of at a good time. I don't think they would stick him. You have, the uh, Bellator is doing a heavyweight tournament. I don't think they'd stick him in that tournament, but that actually is a good um, a good time to be coming in to see some competitors and see kind of where he stands. Um, so we'll see who they give him. But as of right now, Jack Swagger, formerly Jack Swagger, Jake Hager, is going to be fighting in Bellator, no more WWE. He's also going to be still doing his uh, wrestling promotions, his individual independent wrestling promotions on the side, which is really cool. 
Uh, I know Bobby Lashley does that as well. If you guys know, don't know, Bobby Lashley was a former WWE superstar. Uh, an impact. I think he he wrestles with Impact, um, which is another pr- uh, wrestling promotion. Is also an MMA fighter. Um, so that's I think that that's something he can do. It is going to be a little taxing, especially at his age. But we'll see. Good luck to you, Jake Hager. Um, and on those on the kind of the heels of that, I'm actually online and I just saw on Ariel Hawani's page that the matchups are kind of set, not completely finalized, but what it's looking like for this heavyweight tournament that I had mentioned. I think you guys will know a couple of these names. Uh, Quentin Rampage Jackson, who had just signed back with uh, Bellator. Looks like he's going to go in the first round versus Chael Sonnen. You're going to get Matt Mitrione, who is, again, another UFC former UFC fighter, former NFL player, um, is going to be fighting Roy Nelson, who we just mentioned. Ryan Bader versus The Wall. And kind of one of the bigger ones that, um, in my opinion, obviously Fedor, immediately in Aiko, is probably one of the best heavyweights to ever live versus Frank Mir. And so there's no time frame on when those matchups and when the tournament will start. But it's looking like the first quarter of 2018, so January to April-ish. Um, but that's a pretty good tournament, man. I, you don't hear of a lot of these big promotions, especially the UFC, doing a heavyweight tournament. So I think that's a really cool idea, and I think that's that's something that can separate Bellator and can show that they you know, have their own standing to have a tournament of heavyweights going at it, kind of like the old Pride days. If you guys had watched any of the Pride MMA, which uh, Fedor fought in, which Rampage fought in, I think that's that's kind of a cool model to do. Um, so we'll see. Rampage did say he did not want to fight a wrestler in his first fight. Well, Jail Sonnen looks like looks like he's going to get him in the first round, and Jail Sonnen is going to come strictly wrestle him because Rampage is dangerous on his feet. But good for all those guys. I think that's really cool that uh, that they stick that they're doing the UFC heavyweight tournament or UFC the Bellator heavyweight tournament. I think that separates them. I think that gives them a little bit of a different kind of edge that the UFC doesn't have as far as their heavyweight division actually has a little bit of depth. UFC does, but it's just a lot of older guys that aren't really making waves anymore. Granted, a lot of these guys are a little older in, in Bellator, but these are bigger names. Um, and we'll see. We'll see if I were going to pick a winner to come out of there. I mean, Matt Mitrione would probably be the guy. He just knocked out Fedor. And who does that? Right. So, to end off here, a couple of days from now, we have the UFC Sydney event. Uh, like I said, main evented by Fabricio Verdum and Marcin Tabura. I don't know a lot about Marcin Tabura or a lot of fighters on this card. I know of a couple of fighters, and I'm still, again, you guys are with me at the beginning stages of me covering the sport, but I am diving more into the sport as the days go on so I'm becoming just more knowledgeable and trying to soak up as much as I can every single day right and so not only on that card will we have Verdum versus Tybura we'll have Beck Rawlings versus Jessica Rose Clark um, a lot of Australians going to be on this card shocking right in Sydney Australia a lot of Australians going to be on this card um, you have Tim Means coming back to fight I know Tim Means um, from the old UFC days. I don't want to say old, but the early, the, the 2007, 2008 UFC days. Bilal Muhammad will be his opponent. Both uh, United States fighters. Jake Matthews. Another kind of rising Australian fighter. You have Dan Kelly. If you guys don't remember, Dan Kelly beat Rashad Evans. a couple. I think last year, late last year, the December 30th card, maybe. If I'm not mistaken, or maybe early this year, I'm not. I can't quite remember. But Dan Kelly's Australian is going to be on this card. So there's a couple of fun fights. I will be doing a recap of the card afterward. I'm going to have to learn some of these names, though. My lord, Alexander Volkanov, Volkanovsky, Volkanovsky, the Great, Alexander Volkanovsky. We'll learn a couple more of the names. We'll break down the fights when I come back. I thank you guys for watching. There's been so much going on in this week in MMA, and there's so much going on after the 217 card, and I want to kind of talk about that as well. As the UFC card, the UFC 217 card kind of reminded UFC fans that the UFC is still the UFC. MMA is such a plethora of different promotions now where you have, like I said, Cage Warriors, Bellator, you've got 
uh, formerly you had Strike Force, XC Fighting. There's so many different ones. Pride, Ryzen. But the UFC has been the standard for 20 plus years. And that's been because they consistently put on the best cards, the best fighters, the best talent that you can find. And I think 217, you know, there's been such a, uh, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, shitstorm going on with the UFC since being sold to WME. And I think 217 reminded people, hey, you know, we're, we're still the UFC. We still put on these fights that you guys love, and we're still the UFC that makes the best matchups, right? And since then, it's kind of gone right back down the drain as far as, not drain, but it's just gone kind of in that whirlwind where you see just so much popping up. Connor's jumping fences, jumping into cages. Fabricio's throwing boomerangs, and you got, and I didn't talk about this, but Anderson Silva, and I think this is, because there's so much going on, Anderson Silva's kind of sliding right under the radar. But this week, uh, Anderson Silva tested positive again for a banned substance, a PED, that's going to take him off the UFC Shanghai card. Um, it's crazy news because it, at you know more than one point, at multiple points in his career, you, Anderson Silva was considered to be the greatest fighter to ever live. This is the second time he's been popped for using PEDs. That's it. Uh, you're you're out of the top pound for pound list, and he's probably thanking Conor McGregor right now because he's taken all this attention off of Anderson Silva. This last week, Conor's taken every single bit of attention from everything that should be focused on Anderson Silva and him missing and you know getting banned again, testing for a banned substance, and you're not the you can't be the pound for pound goat anymore. In fact, how many times were you on it the entire time? Because Anderson Silva. Is it was an older guy, an oldish guy when he came to the UFC, and he was winning fights in incredible fashion. But since USADA came in, a lot of people are getting popped left and right. So you see a lot of guys that you thought were invincible, i.e., John Jones, um, and you wonder were they doing it the entire time. Not my place to to speculate, but the facts are the facts, and Anderson Silva is out, and incredibly. And I don't know if it's a, the right choice, but incredibly, Michael Bisping, it's going to be, he accepted the fight six days after the UFC 217 card, has accepted to fight Kevin Gastelum in the main event of UFC Bang, or uh, the UFC Shanghai event. I don't want to say Beijing, Shanghai event. Um, I don't know if it's the right choice. I don't know if it was the right choice even sanctioning him, sanctioning him and clearing him to fight. Um, only, I guess, 16 days after you've been choked out to go and do it again. He's got to be dealing with some mental demons, but dang, that guy is a monster. I mean, who else accepts that fight, right? So props to Michael Bisming for accepting UFC. I don't know if you should have booked him, and I don't know if it's a good idea, but the guy's a warrior. Um you got to commend him. Kevin Gaslam is no easy walk in the park either. Kevin Gaslam is a great stand-up. Um, fighting above his weight class, but has some amazing stand-up. And a win over the, the previous champion would be a huge, huge notch in his belt. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I will be doing a preview of that card as well soon. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And I promise you, I know we talk about this every time I'm on here, but I'm not fibbing. I promise you, we will be getting more consistent content for you guys week after week. Um, my computer's fixed now, so we're all good. It was just a computer issue. It wasn't a me issue, all right? Take it easy on me in the comments or wherever you see this podcast. But thank you guys again for watching. This has been the Wade Concept where we are debating slash discussing because I can't figure out which word I like better. Everything. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time.